Hi guys. Okay, in this video, we're going to talk more in depth about the delay line. Uh, I had one person asked that he was interested in understanding a little deeper how this thing delays and how it operates. So, I just brought out the schematic to show it, schematic view. Uh, uh, one little thing here that I want to discuss about this schematic is these two here are not in the unit. Now there's a couple other differences between the unit I have, the oscilloscope I have, and the schematic. But here's one difference here. It, they're just not in there. Uh, I don't know if they were at one point in time or they never were. I don't know. But, otherwise, there are 24 coils, 25 counting these, so, and really they are part of the delay. So that means each coil is dropping uh, approximately 0 0.01 microseconds to add up a total of 0.25 microsecond delay. What we're going to discuss, at, and what really is causing the delay is both the DC resistance of the coils and the wires in between them. So, uh, DC resistance meaning just simply what you measure with your own meter. Uh, if you measured this coil, it would have a certain amount of resistance because it's made of wire and coiled up. And the other is the inductance of each individual coil. Now, the trimmer caps in between really do not add anything really in a practical sense to the delay um, mainly because they're not in series they're across the two lines to keep them matched impedance wise um, you know at the at the beginning of the thing this comes from one tube this side here comes from the other tube goes through and goes to each each side of the plates on the scope so the two sides the impedance total impedance has to stay matched so that's what the the, the capacitors are there for uh, so they themselves actually don't have a huge effect really none practically anyway uh, for a practical matter of the delay so the first thing we're going to talk about is the DC resistance and I drew something up on the whiteboard and uh, I did this ahead of time to try to keep time moving along good now I'll bring this in and see if I can get it set in here um, I'll move this back a little bit there we go And we're going to lift you up just a little bit. Close. There we go. Try to move this over. All right. Some forethought first. First thing to talk about before I explain what this is all about, other than a bunch of lines drawn on there. Uh, in a metal conductor, it has atoms and those atoms are in there in some sort of arrangement now we're going to talk mostly about copper but a lot of the other conductors metal conductors are the same and what that arrangement is is in copper is a cube a crystal structure the shape of a cube so think of it like a salt or a, a sugar cube you know and um, so, or a box, a square box, you know, something kind of like this, except it would be exact cube. In other words, this distance here would be the same as across here and here. Now, where the uh, atoms are located is at each point. Here, 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 and here. So they're all in the, the corners. 
And what holds them together is they're sharing electrons. It's called covalent bonding. It's the strongest known chemical bond. So they're sharing electrons all the way through this thing. Well, the thing is, I have too many electrons with this sharing process going on. So, I have a bunch of free electrons that just have no homes. So they're just kind of randomly moving around inside the crystal. They don't move outside this crystal. The next crystal over up here has its own free electrons and one over here has its own free electrons and so forth. None of them go outside that area. Really, a whole bunch. They don't need to. So that's what we're going to look at one of those electrons. And if we do not have any current flowing through the wire, I have not hooked it up to anything. It's a piece of wire laying out here on the table, okay? Or all power shut off to your radio or whatever it is. Then they're bouncing around in there randomly. And it kind of looks something like this, just picking a starting point someplace. And it'll go up, collide into something, go this way, collide into something, go up this way, collide into something. And, oh yeah, just go out of focus. Really? Anyway, you follow the arrows. Oh boy. It keeps colliding. So... Maybe that I'm just not on here good enough. So, each time it changed direction, it has collided, uh, collided, came in contact with something else, crashed right into it, until it gets back to its starting point, or where we started at. Now, you notice that starting point is not the exact place, same place, and the reason is, is because we lost some energy, um, mainly because... If you have two perfectly solid, perfect objects, okay, like maybe two billiard balls, but they're ideal balls, meaning that they're ideal solid, then you have a perfect, when they collide, you have what is known as a perfect elastic collision, which means that they bounce off each other, you know, one collides in the other one and they'll bounce off perfectly, no energy loss. Problem is, nothing's perfect. No, There's no perfect solid. So, instead of being dead solid, they actually squeeze in a little bit. That absorbs some energy when it does that. If everything was perfect, solid, the electrons and the atoms and everything, these things are bouncing around against then it would come back to the same starting point. So, that's what happens in any piece of wire at any given moment. And it's not just one. There's a whole bunch of electrons in there doing this. That's what they're colliding into each other. They're colliding into the atoms, the corners. They're just bouncing every which way. And the reason why they're doing this is because of heat. Temperature. So... That gives them energy to move randomly, but it also causes the whole thing to vibrate. The whole crystal is vibrating. Everything wants to move. So, and at room temperature, it's a pretty violent vibration. So, now, what happens, though, when I apply current to it? Apply voltage. Turn the power on. Well, the red lines represent electric field going across this area. Now you'll notice that instead of straight lines like we had over here, we have curved lines. In fact, the most curvature will be where it's in per perpendicular to the electric field. So these things curve. This one's basically parallel, so it stays straight. But this one curves. This path back this way curves. And we just get this curvature until we get back to a point where we started from, except it has moved. You notice here it's pretty, pretty close. Here we have moved this much. 
that is known as electron drift due to our electric field. That is actually the flow of current. So, two things to notice here. One, it takes a lot of energy to do this and it takes a lot of energy to get these things to finally drift. We're going through a lot of collisions to get them to finally drift. So that takes in extra energy to do that. If they weren't bouncing around in here and everything, then it would take a lot less energy. So whenever I have to add more energy into the circuit, into something, and into a system I'm losing to get it to do something that is a loss that shouldn't be there. What is loss of energy in an electric circuit is resistance. So it's these collisions, random collisions basically, but these collisions nonetheless is what creates resistance. But also, the path, say from here to here, where it makes its first collision, is pretty darn fast. Getting close to the speed of light. It'll never be the speed of light, but it gets awful close. But this path, much slower. So the drift is way a lot slower than this because I got to go up here, then here, then here, then here, down here, and back up until I finally get to there. Since I'm taking that much longer path, it takes a lot longer for it to get from here to here in the end result for that drift. So we have a delay in the current. That's what's causing your delay. It's the same thing that causes resistance, which is this random bouncing, crashing into stuff, is also the same thing that causes the delay. The greater the resistance, the more the delay. Um, the other thing that will increase this is temperature within a certain standard. So if I increase the temperature, the vibrations increase greater and faster. Also the collisions will increase more. There will be more collisions happening, so that actually reduces this time here reduces this distance. It takes longer to get to the same distance, so my resistance is higher and my path is slower. That's really the nutshell of DC resistance. Now it's more complicated than that to really get the full understanding of it. Um, we have to go into, uh, we have to take into account quantum nature of the electron and everything. Electrons have spin, they have flavor, they have a lot of different things, so we have to take all that in. We're not going to do it. It's way beyond the scope of this video or any one single video anyway. So, but in a nutshell, the reason for this to happen is because of the fact that we have these collisions. And that's what slows the current down. That's what creates resistance. So all conductors have resistance. Now, just to kind of touch on things, there are some conductors out there that are known as superconductors. Um, basically, any conductor can be a superconductor cooled enough. Now there is a temperature known as absolute zero. That's the lowest temperature ever can go. The temperature works out to be, well, generally use the Kelvin scale. So it's zero Kelvin. Uh, we don't say degrees when you're using Kelvin. But that's same as minus 459 degrees Fahrenheit or be more accurate 459.67 degrees Fahrenheit minus 273.15 degrees C so when we get down close to that temperature we hit a temperature called 
that's just named T sub C. It's critical temperature. At that point, resistance drops off to zero. The understanding of this is, it. well, I'm not going to go into it. It's beyond the scope of this, but uh, basically it has to do with the fact that we're not getting the collisions anymore. But there's a, another little thing that happens about called pairing with, uh, with electrons and stuff that basically what it ends up doing is zeroing out the collisions and everything. So then instead of taking all this time to get from here to here and going with this belt, it would actually just right there. So, um, but that's what superconductivity is. Now, that was discovered in 1911 and uh, it, working with a few different materials um, uh, copper, one of them, beryllium, I believe, beryllium oxide, I think, and a couple others. I don't remember all the different uh, ones that they kind of tested. Uh, it, later years, they started warming the temperature up and stuff and everything. So, anyway, but normal conductors is what happens. Now, speaking of conductors, one other little thing I want to talk about before we move on to the rest of the story, and that is, real quickly, uh, for the most part, there's four primary conductors that's used in electronics. Now, there's actually a fifth one, or kind of what you could consider, uh, well, it's a conductor, a steel mainly in the chassis of a radio or TV. Um, you know, a lot of times they use that as their um, ground or return, B minus, because it's real, no, it's easy to work with. I mean, you've got any place you want to attach a ground, you can just attach right to the chassis. But um, it's not really... A normal use, uh, we don't make wire out of it for uh, conducting in electronics anyway, wire conductors out of it. So, the four primary conductors that is used is silver, copper, aluminum, and gold. We're going to talk, about, I want to real quickly touch on the rankings from the best conductor to the worst conductor of the four. Now what do you think is the best conductor? And I'm pretty sure at this point in time you have a lot of people has a particular conductor in mind and if it's the one I'm thinking that they're thinking of uh, they're wrong. So what is the best conductor? Well it's not gold. In fact, gold's the worst. So you might think copper. Copper's used tremendously. No, it's not. It's not the best conductor. It's the second best. What's the best one? It's silver. So the, the list goes silver, then copper, aluminum, and then gold. Um, the difference between silver and copper, they're pretty close. Um, copper's about, silver's about, say, oh, about 35% better conductor, uh, meaning it has about 35% less resistance than gold, than copper has, excuse me, for any given size of wire. All right. Aluminum, on the other hand, has twice the resistance for the same size wire as copper. So when you use aluminum, uh, especially when you're looking at carrying current and concerned about it, you have to use twice the size, double the gauge, twice the size wire to have the same carrier, current carrying capabilities as copper has. So, 
and then when we go to gold, gold is a is four times worse, has four times more resistance than aluminum has. So why do they use gold? Well, assuming that they really are using gold and not some other type of plating on there and just shining it up, making it look like gold, such as maybe a brass or yellow brass or something of that nature. Uh, gold really was is used and its intended purpose is for corrosion control. Gold doesn't corrode. So anything that's, uh, especially uh, either on ships, dealing with salt air along the coast or anything like that. Any connectors, plugs, connectors, stuff of this nature are gold plated. Uh, it's a very thin plating, but it nonetheless is gold plated. The plating's thin enough that the in, uh, increase in resistance doesn't matter anyway. But the main thing is to keep them connectors from corroding. So that's why they use it. Now, as far as some other things, uh, other companies and stuff out there advertising on those for those companies and stuff has really um, pushed gold really hard. Um, they basically try to make it sound like it's really a top conductor and we gold plate our connectors for that or whatever. Uh, they're feeding you full of lies. I'm not even absolutely sure if they really do gold plate. I mean, at the price of gold today. So, but they might on some of the real expensive stuff. But, uh, no, its primary purpose is for corrosion. It's a plating, so you don't have to worry about corrosion. So those contacts, those connectors, will have guaranteed connection, making good contact. All right. So, now that uh, we're done with that, let's look at the other part of this. So, the DC resistance is slowing down our path, our current. But that's not the total thing. Remember in the, uh, I'll just pull one part of the schematic up here, that we have in here, coils also. So, how does that work? Why is the coil? Well, I'm going to draw a nice little line here. And we're going to take and draw a sine wave. So, hopefully I can do this good enough. Now, if I kind of, well, we got a point here, and a point here, and a point here, and we got yeah, approximately about right in here, and right in here. Okay, now, in an inductor, so in any coil, an inductor, voltage leads current by 90 degrees in a perfect inductor. Or, another way of putting it, current lags voltage by 90 degrees. Now I'll go into why, but this is what it looks like. And if I can draw this in nicely. or something close to that. My lines are not perfect. Not a perfect sine wave, but you get the gets of it. So, red is current, blue is voltage. We're in an inductor. So the voltage starts out first. I apply voltage across it sine wave so it starts building up voltage only when it hits peak which is 90 degrees will the current start flowing 
and then the current will hit peak at about the time that the voltage reduces back to zero and then it starts flowing the other direction. As that happens, the current starts going through here through a path like this and starts getting to peak again at the other side. So, it starts flowing negative when we hit the negative peak. It hits peak when the voltage goes back to zero again. So the peaks of the current is going to happen when the voltage is zero. Current begins both its directions starting off at zero at the peaks of the voltage. Now why is that? Well, simply put, it has to do with in any coil of wire. Well, let's take a wire, piece of wire right off the bat. Anytime I put a current through a wire, it, de it, puts a, it develops a magnetic field. Okay. Now, I've talked about this before, you know, left-hand rule, right-hand rule, and things of this nature, but the point is, when I put a current through a wire, a field, a magnetic field builds around it. Now, if it's DC, the field builds up to a certain point and stays. AC, it starts, it'll fluctuate with the AC. If I got a coil, wrap it up in a coil, then that field becomes more concentrated and stronger. As this thing starts building, we start applying voltage and the voltage starts going up, I am building a magnetic field inside that coil. The field is moving because it's building. As it's building, we have motion of the, the flux lines, the magnetic field. They are cutting across that wire. Well, if I take a, a magnet and I hold it stationary and I move a wire through the magnetic field of that magnet, say like a U-shaped magnet, and I run the wire through there, I develop a current. Same thing happens here. The magnetic field is building, except it's what's moving, the wire stays stationary, but it is it will in turn be cutting across some wires, and that produces a voltage. The thing is, the voltage is in opposite direction. So if the, the primary voltage is in this direction, the other voltage is like this. So if I was to show that what is going on on this curve here, and if I can draw it fairly accurately, it is doing something like this. Except really the be the peaks will be almost the same type of height. Excuse the drawing, I'm not that good at this. Uh, especially when I'm working around the camera. So, basically, as the primary voltage is going up, we have a counter EMF going this way. They call it counter EMF. It's counter voltage. It's in the opposite direction. They're canceling. When we hit the peak, at that point, that instant of time, the voltage is stationary. You know, we're not building any more voltage. The field comes stationary. Now the current can start going. As these two... As the field starts, as the, this voltage starts going down, the field. Sorry about that. This camera times out at 29 minutes. I wasn't keeping close, so I'm not sure where I was at. So I may be repeating myself a little bit here. So anyway, when we hit peak, I'm pretty sure I got to the peak here on these two. The voltage is not changing anymore, and the field is stationary then at that point. So the current can start flowing. As our primary voltage that I'm applying across there, that sine wave starts decreasing, the field starts collapsing. Well, the counter amount, it starts creating a counter amount, EMF, in the wrong, in the other direction, which is trying to keep that field built up. Yeah, but the thing is, it's going heading to more positive, same way as the current. So the current continues building, because this is in the same polarity now, until we get to the zero point. At this point, this starts decreasing, the voltage going more negative, 
and this is going more positive because they're we're crossing a point where we've lost the entire field now we're building a field in the opposite direction and a counter EMF in the opposite direction so now they just reverse we go from this way and flip around this way the current hits peak at that point now it's usually going to be less than the voltage because there's some DC resistance so we lose some of our you know we reduce the current some so as this continues on and these are countering it, um, the current starts falling off until we get to a point of zero current right at the peaks again then the current can start building up again as this voltage drops off it will counter them up in the same direction as current so it continues to build as this drops off until we get to this point where there's zero again and then this just continues now, in this, that's happening inside the coil. Once it leaves outside the coil, the two come together instantly, back in phase, until they go into the next coil and they go out of phase. It's due to this phase, this current, which current is what does work. You can have all the voltage in the world, but if you have no current, no work gets done. The current is what is actually going to do the work. It's what's going to build the charge up, the electrostatic field on the plates of the of the uh, CRT to create the deflection. It is if it it's what turns the electric motor. It's what uh, uh, supplies the power to operate transformers and stuff move voice coils everything so only current does the work this delay this is actually a delay at 90 degrees so in each one of these coils I'm getting this rough 90 degree delay and current comes back together but then we delay again and come back together and then we delay again that coupled with the DC resistance delay slowing down the current all combined make up that makes up the total delay of each each coil as well as the total all the coils combined so each coil approximately 0 0.01 microseconds and we actually measure this in impedance now what little math I'll give you today what is impedance at least in this situation Well, the inductor, we have inductive reactants, and you, I've shown that formula before, but to kind of give you better, uh, I'll show it again. It's uh, L for inductor, sub X for reactants. And that equals 2 pi times my inductor, inductance, times my frequency. Now that's going to give me a value in ohms, and it's called inductive reactance. Now, impedance is, since we have the shift of 90 degrees of the current lagging and everything of the voltage, well, what it turns out to be is a, a little graph that we can show. On this line, going this way will be our resistance and also known as the voltage going that way or the current going that way this way is the voltage and also in this is my L sub X this is 90 degrees okay now impedance is the distance from here to here the total amount of resistance and total amount of this that distance is my impedance so the formula for impedance which is Z equals the square root of my inductive reactance 
in this case, squared plus my resistance squared. The Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Right triangle formula here. You got a right triangle. So you want to find the hypotenuse. It's also known as basically vector addition. So, but that's how you figure impedance. So, in other words, we're combining the resistance delay and the inductance delay. And we give it a name, you know, the, the, the total resistance here, or total AC resistance is impedance. And that total impedance is what's going to create the full 0 0.01 microsecond delay for each coil. That works out to 25 coils, basically. We have 0.25 microsecond delay. And that's it in the nutshell for all uh, basic practical purposes on this. That's all really there is. Now, there was another question asked, and I will get to that one about this circuit. And that is wanting to have a, at least an explanation or some demonstration of how to calibrate. You know, remember those have um, all these caps in here, and that's keeping these the impedance the same on both lines. And I'll go into that once I get the scope back together. Uh, I can't go directly into it because I don't have the equipment to actually do the real calibration, but I can sure discuss it and explain how it's done and 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 the like so and but in general uh, doing this as far as that goes all the other calibrations that's in that scope uh, is kind of like uh, uh, doing an alignment and it's kind of like a TV alignments so meaning that for any particular make and model of scope it's going to have, you really need their instructions because they're going to have a unique set of instructions for doing all the calibration including the delay line because in this, on this scope it wants to use a 400 uh, kilohertz square wave to do the calibration of this delay line uh, some other scope might want to use a different frequency you know and stuff like that so I'm not going to go directly into exactly this one for one thing I don't have anything to produce a square wave with that frequency but the other thing too is is all the, all the calibration instructions for this scope will be different for even another Tektronix different model scope would have slightly different things so it's like a, aligning a TV you need to get the service information for a particular TV that you're going to do alignment on because of the, there may be some similarities but there's also differences too so but I can go over it in a nutshell and kind of explain how it's done and how they figured to do it how they uh, come up with the way they do it so I think that's about all I've got for you. Um, again, it, this is not the whole story of this, but it is a good, uh, good proxization of it. You know, especially with the DC resistance, um, there's a lot more to it than that. But it's beyond the scope of any, uh, pretty much any one video. It would take several videos really go over it in it. There's a lot of information there. Uh, so, but I hope you better understand how things get slowed down, uh, how the current gets slowed down, and what's actually causing that resistance in there and uh, stuff. So, and kind of a better understanding of the delay line and how it functions. Uh, which brings me to another point that I'm thinking about. I'm not sure what I'm going to call them or when I'll get started on them, but doing 
uh, just small little videos like I don't know once twice a month maybe I'd like to try to do them once a week but I don't know if I'll be able to do that uh, just basics of stuff you know uh, do one like on voltage uh, basic voltage measurements uh, something on resistors something on capacitors again uh, you know various different little just um, uh, basic things about electronics and, and stuff so uh, if you like the idea you know uh, just comment that you think that might be a great idea and uh, it you know I don't know how long it'll last I don't know how long the videos will be probably different things different subjects would have different links so anyway think about that but for this video that's about all I got so if you like it give it a thumbs up please comment even if I don't get back to answering your comments the comments do help me and uh, at least lets me know how I'm doing and stuff and uh, thank you to my new subscribers so anyway that'll be all I'll see you on the next video.